would like to thank our seminar supporter, Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America, for supporting this seminar. We would not be able to provide these educational programs without the support of our generous partners. If you're like me, the idea of a smart home might sound a little complicated or too futuristic, but it's not. Um, it's amazing what's out there for smart homes. So here with us today are two experts on the topic, Antoinette Verdone and Matthew Colvin are joining us from Improvability, an assistive technology and consulting and sales company that's based in Austin, Texas. Antoinette is a certified assistive technology professional and a rehabilitation engineering technologist. Antoinette has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a graduate degree in biomedical engineering. She has over 22 years of experience working with people with varied disabilities. Antoinette is the founder and lead consultant for Improvability. And Matthew joined Improvability in September of 2016. He has a wide and varied background in a number of industries. He's an EMT, many, had many years in management and customer service before joining Improvability. As a person with cerebral palsy himself, he understands the challenges of people with disabilities. And since joining Improvability, Matthew has thrown himself into the world of assistive technology. He manages most of the equipment installations and trains clients on how to use the equipment uh, that Improvability installs. So I am going to go ahead and turn the time over to them. Thank you so much, Antoinette and Matthew, for being here and uh, take it away. can't hear you, Antoinette. I think you might be muted. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> there you go. Okay, I was saying can make sure everyone can hear me. <laughs> me? No? Yeah, we can hear you, Matthew. Okay, good. So I'm going to share my screen and do the presentation from here. Okay. All righty. Okay, so today we're going to focus on uh, smart home technology and I specifically called the state of the tech 2022 because all the things I'm saying, a lot of what I'm saying is going to be out of date very quickly. Uh, so just as a bit of disclosure, Improvability is a for-profit business and we do resell most of the items listed here. We are focusing on consumer-based items, so they're not things that you have to buy through Improvability. You can buy them in many different places. I'm going to kind of skip the intro part since uh, uh, Marissa already did that, but uh, just to say that, you know, I, for 20 years I've been saying if you can think it's out there and I caught the tail end of the pre previous presentation and, you know, just hearing them talk, you know, that statement becomes more and more true every day. Um, so it's assistive technology is just such a great field and it's so much fun to learn all the new things and stay on top of stuff. So I don't know if you I mean, want to say anything else, Matthew. Well, I mean, y'all pretty much said most of it. I mean, I am not, I did, do have an EMF background and I have been with this company for a long time. All right. So, um, I, I think I'm, I'm going to skip over some of this intro stuff because again, I think you already know these things, but assistive technology is any device or strategy that fills the gap. So um, it's the job of the assistive technologist to really look at the whole picture. Um, again, at the tail end of the last presentation, you know, people were asking, well, what's the best solution for this? What's the best solution for that? Well, there really isn't one. It's what bridges the gap. So you have what the person wants to do, what the person's abilities are, and assistive technology bridges that gap. And um, when we look at assistive technology, the other big piece of the puzzle there, and this is particularly important for smart home technology, is the context and the environment in, wh in which the equipment is going to be used. So that's something we definitely have to take into consideration there. So all of those things, so if you look at that picture, it kind of really gives a good visual of how assistive technology works together with what the person can do the activity they're trying to do and the context in which they're wanting to do it. So there's a lot of people who practice assistive technology. This is just kind of a short top list. Um, 
so I think as a consumer, it can be overwhelming, you know, where do I start? Who do I go to? And there really isn't a quick, good answer for that. But I think the thing to know is that there's a lot of people who touch assistive technology in different ways. Something as a consumer that I think is important for people to know about is that there is a certification that professionals who work in assistive technology can obtain, which is called the ATP, which stands for Assistive Technology Professional. That is administered by Resna. So if you really, you know, are have have no clue where to start, one way is you could go onto Resna's website and find an ATP in your area. Even if they don't work in the area of assistive technology that you're looking for, a lot of times they will be connected enough to know who to point you towards. So that's another kind of um, if you don't know where to go, a place to start. Now, the ATP is a certification, it's not a license, it doesn't say that someone's an expert, but what it does say is that as a professional, I am choosing to be part of an industry. So I see, especially on the vendor side, you see a lot of vendors out there that don't hold the ATP, and I'm not saying that they're bad people and don't know what they're doing, but that ATP, especially for someone who maybe is coming at assistive technology from a different perspective, maybe they aren't an occupational therapist or physical therapist, they don't have that medical background, having the ATP just shows that they're acknowledging that they're part of the industry. So if I was a consumer, anyone who was making recommendations for me, I would want them to have that certification to show that they are part of the industry. All right, so now let's talk about uh, smart home. So people use all these terms kind of interchangeably. Some people will say home automation, smart home, environmental control, kind of old old terminology is ECU, which stands for environmental control unit. And I'll show you some pictures of what those were. We're kind of getting away from that term just because it really doesn't apply anymore. Another term that you will see a lot um, in documentation is EADL, which is electronic aids for daily living. In my mind, all of those terms are interchangeable. So for the purpose of this presentation, we're referring to devices and strategies that allow a person with a disability to control the items in their environment remotely. So that's what we're talking about. And we're really gonna talk about like handyman level type equipment. We're not gonna get into things that are more complicated than that. So I've kind of already said this, but really at this point, this presentation is out of date now. Um, there's going to be something that comes out probably later today and tomorrow that a statement that I say today may not be true tomorrow. So that this is kind of a pro and a con when we, now that we've made the shift to in the assistive technology world using consumer-based equipment is that we don't have control as much as we used to, which is a good thing because things get updated a lot, which is great, but that also means that a company can go out of business or Amazon could just decide to, you know, stop doing something that they were doing without any warning and we don't really get a say at that. And I'm really, I really promise I'm trying to keep this an entry level presentation, but I think you'll see things do start to get complicated quickly. So I'm really trying to keep this um, where it is it would be useful for someone who doesn't know anything about home automation, but just know that it, it gets a little hairy quickly once we start bringing in all the different aspects here. So one of the things we need to understand before we even get into talking about all the fun stuff is some terminology. And this is really important because different products use different protocols and if you're starting to want to put some of this stuff in your home, you need to at least understand these enough to know that you need like for like. So if you have a hub that only does Zigbee equipment, you need to make sure that the device that you're buying is Zigbee. That being said, when you go on some of these websites, they hide this information. Like if you look at a manufacturer's website, sometimes they do not make it very clear. Um, what protocol they're using. So I'm just going to go through this uh, list so that we can understand what these words mean. So IR or infrared is what you typically would think of as your television remote. So it's literally um, an infrared light. So this is also changing too. Some TVs and cable systems don't use infrared anymore, but what that means is it requires line of sight. So your typical television remote 
when you push the button, you have to point it towards the television. If you go into another room and try to change the channel, it doesn't work. That's infrared. Radio frequency, most people would be familiar with this with your garage door opener. So that does not require line of sight. It's a radio signal that gets sent and there's a range to where, you know, you can probably be maybe one house down and hit your garage remote and the garage door will open. But if you're 10 blocks away, you can't operate your garage door. So that's the range of that. Most of us are familiar with the term Wi-Fi and actually just uh, kind of a bit of trivia. Wi-Fi actually doesn't stand for anything. It's just a term that started to get used and now we just use that term. Now, the reason I put Wi-Fi and Internet next to each other is because Wi-Fi is really just a portal for information to go through. So you can think of Wi-Fi as a pipe and you can have Internet or other information going through that pipe. But you can have a Wi-Fi network that doesn't have Internet. So sometimes people use Wi-Fi and Internet interchangeably, but they're actually two separate things. I hope that's not too confusing. Uh, Zigbee is a form of radio frequency that is used in the home automation market. Um, it's been around for a long time. It wasn't super popular up, up until the last couple of years where an Amazon started including Zigbee hubs in some of their devices. So um, now you're seeing a lot, just in the last year, there's a lot more Zigbee products out there because of that. Z-Wave is another radio frequency protocol that's been around for a very long time and has been well established and has a standard that is very well followed and is used in a lot of home automation uh, products. Bluetooth is another radio frequency that has a short range, uh, more like 30 to 50 feet with nothing in between. We're all familiar with that with like our Bluetooth headsets, but there are some smart home devices that use Bluetooth. Kind of a popular use is um, to be able to use Bluetooth in your phone to uh, operate a lock, which makes sense because you would not want a long range signal for that. So the idea is, you know, I need to get close enough with my phone, you know, between 30 and 50 feet to be able to unlock my lock uh, for security purposes. Insteon is a proprietary protocol that was made um, by a company. They recently, and it was around for a long time, it's been adopted by a lot of, um, a lot of people adopted it. There was a moment, it was in April of this year, that uh, the company just stopped and all you, all the Insteon equipment just stopped working for, it was about, I think, six weeks. And then it was actually a consortium of, what's that, Matthew? Yeah, it was, it was probably about six weeks. It actually stopped working on April 15th. And it wasn't until the beginning of June till I got the email that, that it was coming up. Yeah, so what happened was the company went out of business and they didn't like warn anybody. They just literally shut the doors and everything turned off so you couldn't operate any of your devices. And then a consortium of customers actually got together and have now resurrected the company. So for a second there, we thought Insteon was gone forever, but it looks like it has been resurrected. Um, and X10 is a really old protocol from the 70s, but it's still it's still out there. That protocol, Insteon and X10, they both use radio frequency and house wiring as the way to communicate with things. So, okay, we've gotten through all the definitions. Um, so now that you understand kind of, you know, the jargon that can be really helpful when you're looking at products and what's happening now because I mean, I would say it's really because of I'm going to so I'm going to say uh, Amazon's smart home device. Her name is Alexa. We call her Madam A because I don't want to set off all your devices. But because of Madam A's ubiquity at this point and also Google Home and these other things, there really has become a groundswell where a standard is needed. So um, in 2019, um, there was a project that got started and we're just now starting to see some commercial products. So the new, this new home automation standard that has come out is called Matter and it does not cover everything. Um, 
and I don't know all the ins and outs of it, so I'll, I'll let you do the research on that. But that's something you may start seeing on devices that it'll say matter compatible. Um, so just kind of be aware that that is a standard that is, it's just starting now, so it's it's only gonna get better. And it's the, the dream is that you could buy any device that is matter compliant and they will all work together. That's the dream. We're not quite there yet. We're just in the infancy stages, but it, it's coming. So before we get into, you know, kind of today's stuff, let's take a trip in the Wayback Machine to 2015, which doesn't sound like it was that long ago, but I mean, that's eight years ago or nine years ago. Um, so that I would say that was the inflection point where before 2015, these were the devices for if you were a person with a disability and could not um, operate standard remotes, these are the items that were available to you. As far as I know, I know the quartet is still being made. The pilot is no longer being made. I don't know about the Primo. Um, so some of these devices are still out there, but uh, some of them have gone away. So these were proprietary devices that could, some of them, most of these did X10 and infrared. I don't think any of these did Z-Wave or Zigbee. So that's what the protocol that they used. Um, and these were programs specific to your house, to your television. If you got a new TV, you had to start all over again and it was a whole process. Um, so that's kind of where we were before 2015. Um, I have on here Control 4 and Crestron. These are more um, companies that, they've been around for a long time, but they, were more for you know million dollar homes you know bill gates wants to have home automation in his house he would use one of those systems now what has happened is that because the market is there um, these companies are now starting to offer more affordable options um, but those companies have been around a long time so if you had an unlimited budget and you just said you know make my house smart those would be the companies that you would call so that's kind of where we were in 2015 and then it was actually first released in November of 2014, along comes Madam A. And this was really a game changer. And I, I will be the first to admit, I kind of poo-pooed Madam A for a long time, just because, you know, I've been, I've been, maybe I've been in this industry for too long, but the idea that anyone could walk up to a device and say, you know, what's the weather and that she would understand you and be able to answer you appropriately. I just was skeptical that that technology was there. And, you know, a couple, maybe about a year is going on and everyone keeps talking about it. I was hearing about it on disability podcasts and stuff. I'm like, okay, fine, I will buy one of these things. And so I finally bought one and, you know, kind of, you know, they, they, it really has just become ubiquitous at this point. So kind of the combination of something like a Madam A being available and also the ubiquitousness of smart device uh, smartphones and most things being connected to the internet in the last couple of years there's just been this explosion of commercial devices for home automation uh so i had done a presentation i want to say it was in 2016 and that was kind of at the inflection point of where things weren't quite there yet for people with disabilities because you could cobble together a system but it wasn't easy to use so it's really amazing where we've come from when all this commercial stuff kind of started coming out to where we are now um i put the nest kind of in the middle because i would say that was my gateway drug into this uh commercial um level of home automation that was my first kind of internet connected device that i had and i've just been kind of adding things along and um uh, I think the Nest was kind of the first one of those internet connected devices that a lot of people had in their homes. So uh, I've been mentioning Madam A a lot, but there also is Google Home and HomeKit. These are kind of like the three big players when it comes to consumer home automation. And a lot of the devices we're going to talk about will work with, for sure, Madam A and Google Home. Um, I will say right now, Madame definitely has the leg up as far as home automation goes. Um, that's just been our experience. It's not saying that you can't do these things with the other systems, but that's just, and also it's become our kind of to-go system. HomeKit, 
is still kind of maturing a little bit. Um, they are adopting matter, so they are definitely you know, in the mix there. Uh, for people who are very concerned about security, they seem to have a little bit higher um, protocol for security. But for this presentation, we're going to focus on Madame, but that doesn't mean that these things don't work on those other platforms. Because again, it's just too much to try to explain all those things. So one huge benefit of using consumer equipment versus, you know, back in the day when you had to buy one, I mean, those boxes were thousands of dollars. But the nice thing is that you don't have to buy everything at once. So you don't have to have all of your light switches available to program to the special box, because if you add a light switch, we have to erase that program and install over again. You can start slow. So think of, you know, oh, wow, you know, this light, this, um, lamp is really hard for me to get to so i can um i wish that i didn't have to reach over to turn on that lamp maybe i'll get a smart plug for that or the thermostat is a great like i said kind of gateway drug for getting into the uh, smart home stuff so that's the great thing about this so just as an example and i would say my home is probably pretty close to what a lot of our setups are. I think people think, oh, I need 100 light switches and I need 12 million of these things. But I would say my setup is probably maybe a little bit more than a median system, median system of what we set up for clients. So I have 14 light switches that I have control over. I have three plug outlets, two motion detectors. I have two locks. I have three cameras one of them being a doorbell camera, one thermostat. And I do have one TV that I operate. I only use Madame A really to turn the system on and off. And then I actually use the handheld remotes to do the stuff. Um, so this is just kind of an example, uh, but I did not buy all these things at once. I bought the thermostat. Then, you know, I said, oh, let's do a couple light switches. Okay, let's do a couple outlets. No, let me, oh, I wanna do a couple more switches. So I kind of just added things as I went along. So if you're some, someone, whether you have a disability or not, if you're looking to do home automation, you really need to kind of think through and not just start buying stuff. Because um, I can tell you uh, what's happening now is most clients' homes that we go to to do an environmental control evaluation, they already have at least something. They either have a smart thermostat or they'll have a smart speaker. Maybe they're not using it to its full potential, but most people actually already have some stuff. I can think of one client in particular they had all of the things, but they hadn't really thought through what's the right solution. So he actually had too many options and it was, he was overwhelming himself. <clears throat> Excuse me. So take a moment to kind of think through what you're trying to do. So really the most important question is what is the list of things that you want to have control over? Because depend, cert, if certain things are in that list, it's going to point you down a certain road. Also, access method is really important. So we work with a lot of people who have ALS who maybe can use their voice today, but we know that there's a high possibility that their voice will not be functional for their entire life. So we have to think, okay, if your voice stops being useful, how are we going to operate these things? And there are a couple different ways to do that. There's, in my opinion, a good way to do it and there's like a not so great way to do it so we want to choose devices that we can do it the most robust way and if and specifically if you have a progressive disability you want to make sure that anything you purchase you're going to be able to access so you don't want well when i can't use my voice i'm going to have to rebuy all these things or if i can't hit the button on the remote i'm going to have to rebuy stuff so taking a second to kind of think through that and making sure that for your situation, you're not going to be in a situation where you're going to lose access. <clears throat> so Matthew, you're going to take this one. Uh, sure. Um, you definitely need good Wi-Fi signal on a lot of these custom units on it. more of the of the, the often shell you need to make sure that you are able to stream if you have uh no internet to like sell your internet and it's not consistent 
physically there, then you cannot free lie on it. Um, you are going to have multiple uh, accounts. You're going to have multiple passwords. That's because your door system uses this account. Your lights may use a different account. Your TV uses another account. You're going to have multiple accounts. On some people, that can um, be over. Overwhelming on them. Just note that, I mean, something like what a company like us do is we'll actually set up all of those accounts, actually help you to a point that you don't need to use those other accounts in your daily life. You just need those accounts to get the item there. But once the cake is actually done, you should never need it unless you're adding or have technical problems with it. Any other stuff? And then just to say that, um, you know, again, focus really on, you know, you as the user need to decide what are like, you know, your top two or three things that you must be able to do and kind of focus on that. And, you know, with the consumer stuff, you know, getting everything set up and installed and working, you know, being able to turn on and off the light switch, that's actually not, that doesn't take days and days and days to do. What takes time is all the tweaking to really make the system, those automations and trying to make it so that it works as well as it needs to for the client. You know, if we want to have a motion detector operate some other items, you know, doing all that tweaking and actually you kind of don't know those things until you live with it for a while, but I mean, yeah. that can be an unending process. Yeah, I mean, I'll deal with people month later and they just need something tweaked. So that does happen. Um, in order to control a lot of these devices, you need a central point, a central hub that you're going to give a voice command, something going to pick up that voice command, and it's either going to control the the item that you ask, or it's going to hand it off to another hub that that hub then um, translates it to the item that you're asking. Um, they now have Amazon X go that actually do have a Zigbee hub inside of them. If you are going in the Wi-Fi or the Zigbee route, then you could just get away with just an Alexa hub and run all of your items through a Alexa direct now, I can tell you personally, I use the, the smart thing hub. Um, used to be through Samsung, but now Aerotech is, they're actually taking the lead on it and they taking it over. That is a a stable hub. It will control the wave, Zigbee, I mean, a lot more different channels. You can use it in your telephone, on your computer. You can use it through Alexa's, um, Google. I mean, pretty much most, if not all of the voice. Um, the only downside to it is it's going to cost you an extra hundred twenty. So that is the major downside on that. Uh, like, oh, well, I'm all pretty talking on it. The AeroTech is easy to transfer them, meaning if I hook the AeroTech hub to the router directly, 
and I get a new router, I just don't put the plug and plug, get in. I'm done. Like it is that simple. It used to not be. You used to have to do a repair no matter what. Now, if you do have the tech hooked in via wipe, fine. You do have to give it the new wipe five credentials. But if you know how to do your your telephone to the new credential, then you should be okay with that. Um, you can give free mode access says to this hub, meaning if my mom had my login name and my password, she could just unlock my door. Now, you you have to understand they don't just get your wife by your password and they're in. Then there is a two-step authentication. There they there they process to set some one up. So I can't just randomly get your you also have to allow me in there, but you are able to give other people access to your units. And then, like the uh, cons are, is that it is another unit that you do have to purchase, and there are other items that it, it's not compatible to. Um, on the um, Smart stuff on the smart thing hub mainly most people lights outlets and on outlets. I'm not talking about um turning on and off their T be on outlet. You cannot do that. Outlets imagine you pulling the the item. plug out and then you plug the item back in. Does the item uh, stay on its last known setting? So your old grandma's light that had that ch ch chunk, of, chunk of switch on it that makes the noises when you click it, when it's on and you pull it out, it's off. You can put a smart outlet there to can to mimic that mo that m movement, um, and then smart bulbs, you actually keep your dumb, which I call them dumb light, but your normal light switch onto the on position, and then you actually control the power to the bulb itself, meaning that the there is always power going to the bulbs. Now, the downside to that is if someone turns off that switch next to the door, it doesn't matter how much you try to tell it to turn on. It'll never turn on. Wait, what? Matthew, can you turn on the computer via voice if it's Full play off. Just wanted to let people know. Oh, okay. Um, there are ways to turn on and off. Com computers. Um, but depending on what you have, that's all custom. Like, like I have literally opened up a computer and. Put a a new device in side of it with a solder spring iron. So yes, you can do that, but it ain't, if not on aisle to a Home Depot, like you're gonna have to make that. Um, you can also control dead bolts, um, which is more simple now than it used to. Most people know how to control deadbolt. Most people do have a smart deadbolt at their house. Now, half the people who have smart deadbolts at their house, they're always dead. The problem is if you don't keep 
power to them. They, they're just not smart anymore. Um, and then, of course, the air conditioning, most people get that one quick. Cameras, you can put those in also. And then replay. If I have a door opener, which is what this one talking on, an automatic door opener, you can put a replay in that door opener to open and close that door. And that's what this is talking Get on, and and then the the last bulletin point is the one after rule them all. Tim, our smart things does so many of them that it's hard to to have something that you want done that you cannot connect. To that hub. Now you may not be able to connect it to that hub using this particular device, but you can almost connect that action to that hub. You just may need to use another way. And then all of this is all of the the um, the items and all the protocols and all the companies that that hub is able to use so for example when we did when i did that presentation in 2016 you know you were having to go in and out of multiple apps to control everything but if you choose things that work with smart things then that smart things app can be the one app that controls everything um so i'm really sad that <laughs> the logitech harmony was our go-to solution for tv and other infrared controls um but unfortunately, it has been discontinued. Um, so I, I just probably the next time I do my presentation, I'll finally take the slide out. It just kind of makes me sad because um, there really isn't a um, a real uh, substitute for it yet. There's a couple products out there, but nothing that I found that completely replaces it yet. So for television control, um, we now our go-to solution is the uh, Fire Cube. And it gives you almost hands-free control over your TV. Um, it's pretty, it, well, it actually, it's not pretty. It is very easy to set up. It, that's one, another positive of all this consumer stuff is that um, you, uh, they have to make it easy for consumers to use instead of just ha or having to have an engineering degree to figure some of this stuff out. So the first time I set up the fire cube, I was like, wait, did I just do it? Like it was so easy to compare to how we had to do it. Um, just to know it does require HDMI input to operate. Um, there is no customization again, as of the, this, the writing of this presentation, I'm sure that will come at some point. So if it doesn't find your TV or for whatever reason it doesn't, it can't control your TV, like, there's no way to learn codes or anything like that. Um, it can control some cable systems. Uh, the nice thing is when, if you're using this, this is um, anything you can say to Madame A, you can say to a fire cube. So if this is your voice control speaker, when you say the wake word, it mutes your TV by default, which is nice. So it makes it easy. Uh, we have a lot of clients that like to use this uh, because if you have a ring camera, you can view your ring video on your television, which is really nice. And if you add a, t a webcam, your TV basically becomes a large echo show, which uh, again, a lot of clients like. And I have a link here for you to see that, but we're not going to go to that right now. Um, this is another option for infrared control, which uh, the Broadlink, they have a couple different products. Um, it can learn infrared and RF signals. Um, this is not user-friendly and it's uh, it's kind of a pain to set up and to, to do voice control, it's a whole process. So you can get it done, but I'm gonna say this is not an entry level device, but I just wanted to mention it. And then here's just some pictures of the things that Matthew was talking about. So like you have oh, on the right, you have an outlet module. So like he was saying, if you have a lot, a lot of times we use this for fans. So someone has a stand up fan. Again, the fan, the way this works is it's the same as you plugging and unplugging it from the wall. So some fans now, if you plug them in, 
and unplug them and plug them back in, they do not come back on. So we need like the $10 version, you know, from Walmart, basic, the cheapest fan you can buy, that's gonna work with this. Uh, and then you can see, like you said, you could replace your light bulbs. Uh, and as far as I know, all the smart bulbs are LED bulbs, so they will last for a long time, which is good because they're more expensive than regular light bulbs. And you can replace your light switches with smart light switches that you can have control over. We have been using the Ring doorbell as our video doorbell. Um, they did recently discontinue their Windows app, so if someone needs to be able to access their smart things on a Windows platform, you can no longer do that. Um, Arlo is another option that does have a way to do that. Uh, it can be paired with smart things, and because it's owned by Amazon, if you're going to use the Echo devices, there's really good integration there. Um, can be used with Google Home too. Uh, the smart thermostat that we've defaulted to is the Ecobee. There are some actually other ones that have recently come out that we've been playing around with, but right now this is our go-to. Uh, and for locks, we've been using Schlage and Quickset, either their Z-Wave or Zigbee versions paired with smart things. Um, so if you've never set up any sort of home automation stuff, or even just to understand how Madam A works, and again, this would be very similar to Google Home as well, but there is an Alexa app, which is different than your Amazon app. So it's not the same app you go to to purchase things. There's a separate app just for Madam A. And in that app, you'll see all of your devices. So this is just some screenshots to kind of show you what that looks like. Um, and inside of the Alexa ecosystem is what they have, what they have are called skills. So you can think of a skill is like an app for specific to Alexa. And there are some like smart things. That's what connects your smart things to your Echo device so that they can talk to each other or like the ring app, a uh, ring skill connects those two things. But so that's where you're actually connecting things. But there are some other skill. There's tons of skills on the, if, when you go to look for them. So something like question of the day, that's just a skill. It doesn't connect anything. It's just once you install that skill, then there's some voice commands you can say, you know, um, Madame A, what's the question of the day? And it's a little game that you can play. Uh, uh, one that is really popular with people with disabilities is the Ask My Buddy. So that there's a website you go to, you create an account, and then you, install the skill on your Madam A device and you there, I forget exactly how you say it, but it's like a ask my buddy to call for help and you will have already put in, I think it's three or four people, their emails, phone numbers, and it emails and uh, texts. It's, it just kind of sends out a blast to all the people that you've put in there. You know, Antoinette needs help give her a call or call 911, you know, you, you put messages in there. So there's some skills like that that don't even require any additional hardware. If you want to control your smart home stuff through a Windows computer, this is a really great option. It's called The Home Remote, and that's the website, thehomeremote.com. And it's an aggregate of smart home devices where anything that works with the home remote, you can operate on your Windows computer. Uh, it does put everything in one place, and there, if you're using Alexa, there is a Madam A app for Windows, but you can't really customize it, and a lot of times you have to scroll, and we work with a lot of people who use iGaze, and that can be really hard for them to do. So the nice thing about the home remote is that their user interface is customizable, so you can group things together so that people don't have to scroll as much. Um, and this is the list of things that work with it. So smart things is in here. Um, so if you are needing to control something through a computer, through a Windows computer, you'd want to make sure that whatever you're choosing will work with this. But if it works with smart things, it will work with this. So just some other kind of kind of generic things I wanted to mention. Um, if you're dealing with someone, I'm, I'm saying elderly, and I, I don't want to offend anybody, but or someone with some sort of cognitive deficits. Um, there are some features that could be useful in that specific situation. Um, a thing that a lot of our clients really like is the two-way calling. And specifically, as far as I know, this is not available on Google Home, um, is drop-in. 
So what that is, is any of your video enabled devices. So if you look at the picture on the left, that is someone connecting a fire cube with the webcam to a television. So you can turn your television into a video device or Amazon does sell devices that have video screens in them. So if you have a video device, you can set up drop in where the caregiver can automatically pull up the video and and see and talk to their person. Um, so or you can do what's called calling. So this could be something inside the home, say caregivers upstairs on the second floor, users on the first floor, they can call the bedroom and then they can have either audio and or video between the two devices. So um, like I said, uh, our care caregivers really like that because they're at the grocery store or they're out and about and they just want to see and hear their person that, that they want to talk to, they can do that and the person on the other end doesn't have to do anything. You can create your own skill. So this is the website. It's actually pretty simple. So you could have, um, you can make up your own questions. So if you have a user that asks the same question all the time and um, or needs to be able to get an answer to a question, you can actually make your own skill. Um, Routines. So this is, and this is where, this is what I was talking about of things taking, you know, this is where the time suck happens. If you start to get into routines, you can get really creative and do some really fancy stuff. Here's three examples. Um, one could be a medication reminder. There are actually some skills specifically for medication reminders. Um, but you could just literally make a reminder that, you know, so this one is at 10 a.m. Alexa will set will announce it's time to take the blue pill. I mean, that's just a real simple example. You could make a routine. What is my daughter's name? So when you say, A, what's my daughter's name? Alexa would answer your daughter, daughter's name is Antoinette. So again, just a super simple example, but I think it kind of gets you um, thinking. So when you, if you start fooling around with this, when you look at what the different triggers are, I didn't even know this till the first time I made up this presentation. I was just looking at what the different triggers were and one of the triggers was coughing. So you could, maybe this is the um, Madame A device that's in my mom's bedroom. If it hears her coughing a lot, it would actually announce on the Echo device that's in my bedroom saying mom is coughing. So that's just, uh, again, and they're constantly adding new things. So every time you go in there, you might see something new. Alexa Guard is a feature. It does not cost anything. And basically what it does is it uses all of your Alexa devices to kind of um, do some basic like home security stuff where you can get some alerts. If you have specific equipment connected to Alexa, like the smoke, your smoke alarms and stuff, it will utilize that as well. But even if you didn't have any other stuff, if you just had your Alexa devices, it uses the sound detection to um, kind of give you a, a home on a home uh, alarm system. There used to be a thing called Care Hub, which was free, but that has since been replaced by Alexa together. And because now there are a lot of people that are using Alexa devices to monitor either elderly parents or just remote loved ones that they are caring for. So they have now created this system. Um, there is a fee uh, per month uh, and you can have all these different things. So you can have different family members. So it makes it much easier before you had to log in to the one account and it just was a little unwieldy. So this makes this a, a much simpler system. So that might be something you would be interested in looking at. So just to kind of recap what we've talked about today. So, you know, when we, if you're really wanting to set up a system for yourself, this is kind of like the thought process that we go through. So it's, you know, really make that list of what you want to con need to control first. So these are like the four things I have to be able to do because I have no other way to do it. And then you could have your list of wants so that if that's possible, you can add those. Uh, determining how complicated of a system the person can handle to decide, you know, how we want to operate these things. Because voice is great, but I think something people don't always think about voice is that you have to memorize the commands and that's not always easy for everybody. So actually using an app can be a, a it's a lower cognitive load. Uh, 
so we've kind of already talked about this, you know, definitely think about your access method and make sure that no, if you're, if you have a degenerative disease where your access method level could change to make sure that you're going to be able to maintain access. Um, what's the budget? So the great thing is now if you have, you know, let's say you have $500, you can get a nice starter system. And then think about it. If you spent, you know, $30 a month, you know, so that's like a light switch a month. At the end of the year, you'd have 12 light switches, which for most people is going to be more than what they need. Uh, and then that's then once you kind of get that together, then, you know, it can be kind of a never ending process of pros and cons. So at some point you just got to pull the trigger. That's why I gave you all our to go our go to system, because there's just so many options there. If you just really don't know where to start, that would be a good place to start. So um, funding for this equipment is not going to be available through medical insurance because medical insurance doesn't really recognize this kind of stuff as medical equipment. But another avenue, um, if you are working or looking to work, vocational rehab can sometimes fund this kind of equipment. It has to be related to work, so they're not going to, you know, mac daddy your whole house. But we do a lot of door openers so that people can independently get in and out of their home and, you know, a couple light switches here and there so that they can get ready for work. The VA, this is, the VA does pay for environmental controls. Workman's comp, and like I said, you know, private pay as you go. So kind of start with maybe 500 bucks and then just add a device a month and all of a sudden you turn around and you have a pretty sophisticated system. If this is something you're really interested in and you want to learn more, um, I would say the best way to learn is to, you know, spend that, you know, couple hundred dollars and get yourself started. That's how you really learn these things. Um, so don't be scared. You know, you can just start with Alexa, a hub, and a plug module. Super simple. You know, that's pro that's less than 500 bucks. You know, that's maybe less than $300. And that that could be your gateway drug into, uh, you know, once you get a taste, you're like, ooh, I want to add this. Ooh, I want to add that. Uh, this podcast, Stacy on IoT, is a really awesome podcast. It's what I use to try to stay on top of all this stuff. Again, it's it's a never-ending battle, but uh, it's a really good resource. She talks a lot about home automation as well as industrial automation, um, and uh, so that's a, the best source that I know of. There's also a uh, Facebook and LinkedIn groups. Um, so any of the manufacturers of equipment, you know, you can get on there. So like you can um, follow smart things on Facebook and LinkedIn. And so you will be made aware when changes happen. Um, also AT groups will talk about this stuff a lot. And um, I know I'm a member of a couple professional groups and um, it's just a way to kind of throw out questions and get answers and other people who um, do the same thing. And then we I have our contact information here. I'll put our emails in the chat. Feel free to reach out to us if you have a question. Um, you know, if we if we don't know the answer, if you're not in our area that we serve, you know, we're happy to point you in the right direction. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Antoinette and Matthew. Um, I know my my head's spinning a little bit just thinking through all the the different avenues and things that you can do. Um, it's quite amazing, um, and as you said, the technology just keeps evolving and, and changing. So um, thank you both for being here. Um, let's go ahead and see. There were a couple of questions I think in the chat, um, so let me pull those up. Um, there was a question about what are your thoughts on Google's thread and the new protocol matter? I think you're muted, Antoinette. Sorry about that. Uh, it's just getting started right now. You're you're just starting to see the very first products. Some things will be backwards compatible, some devices, others uh, will not. Um, so uh, it, it's there. The, the good news is there is a protocol that has been created. So moving forward, that's going to make the home automation stuff a lot easier to discern. So like a lot of these pros and cons that we talked about won't be the case because as long as you put, well, you won't need to know about Zigbee, Z-Wave, da, 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 da. Is it, if it works with Matter, you know they will all work together. So there's going to be a lot of cross-platform cross, pollen, cross platform, um 
interoperability, which does not exist right now. So there's certain things that if you buy this equipment, it only works, these two things work together and they do not talk to anybody else. But if, if those things are all matter compliant, then they are all going to talk to each other. Great, thank you. Um, another question, and, and you did touch on this a little bit, but do you know if there are any grants like outside of a waiver program to help cover the cost of buying um, something like a, a, a lock, an automatic lock? Um, I mean, the, the funding is definitely, um, you know, it, because you're outside the medical model, uh, it's depending on what your disability is, there could be some disability organizations. Like I can speak to the ALS association, certain areas. Like I just happen to know that the Minnesota chapter has a home automation program. So if you had ALS and you lived in their coverage area, you call them, they have like a kit that they can provide you with. So that's just one little tiny example. So um, the good news is to get started is not super expensive. So, you know, the holidays are coming up. So maybe we buy everybody, you know, like an Amazon gift card, you know, so that, hey, you know, if I could get, you know, a couple hundred bucks of gift cards together, then I can get my, get my process started there. And then another question, um, do you see a standardization happening across the platforms eventually? Um, would hate to invest a lot of money into a system only to have it discontinued. Well, and you know, that that was a big issue a number of years ago because it was kind of the Wild West. There was this explosion of commercial devices. And I mean, I can speak for myself. You know, I also watch Kickstarter and there were a couple really cool, I would consider them assistive technology that came through on Kickstarter. But and I, I wouldn't give them to a client until they were a real company. But some of those, you know, they they did their Kickstarter run and I got my device and it worked and then they went out of business. So that's why you know, we've kind of settled on smart things because um, smart things was their own company. And I could tell like, you know, there was some dust that settled and they were still around then smart uh, Samsung bought them. So I'm like, okay, if Samsung's in investing in this company, I think we'll be okay. So they really t um, stayed the test of time. So I would say at this point, you know, if you go with something that works with smart things, that platform, I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. That's another big benefit of this matter compliance. Again, it, it's, it's not quite there yet, but you know, once that's really established, then if you get something that works with matter, if you chose a hub that goes out of business, you should be able to just go buy another matter hub and you'd be good to go. So keep an eye out for matter, but it's not, quite, you know, it's going to be hard to find products right now because it's very limited, but that's what's coming down the pipe. Yeah, and also on that, um, we were talking earlier, there was a company called Insteon, and they had their own hub, but they also had their own items, and they, they didn't play with, with anyone else. If the Sam Sun Pub go out of business today. They're not proprietary equipment. You just go get another pub that is compatible to that that frequent C and reprogram it, and you're good. Pretty much. I mean, I'm gonna dumb it down hard, but that pub is like an AMFM. All you need is to just go get another stereo and it's going to pick up those clubs. They're not proprietary to just that one receiver. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Thank you. Um, another question came in. Can you elaborate on the My Buddy skill? So that skill, again, there's a website um, that you go to and you set up the account. And the idea is, I want to say it's either three or four people that you can put in their email their and their phone number. And then when you give the command, it automatically sends them an email, texts them a message, a, a pre-made message that you put in there. So it doesn't, I'm not going to say it replaces like Lifeline or anything like that, but if you're scared of falling, that could be kind of a backup 
if you fall, you would say, Alexa asks my buddy to alert everybody and then everybody gets the message. And so hopefully, you know, you have someone that's a neighbor that would be able to come by and just make sure that you're okay. And another question came in, um, what is a good automatic door opener? So we install uh, Open Sesame door openers. They're, I'll put their website in the chat. chat. It's opensesamedoor.com. They really are the industry standard for door openers. There are some, they are not inexpensive. They are an expensive item and they're expensive to install, but they work. I mean, we have clients that have had them for over 10 years and all they've ever had to do is, is replace a battery. So they are just workhorses and when you're talking about a door that you you know, the, usually the purpose we do it is for emergency we, you want it to work all the time there are some less expensive options out there and i have seen people install them on exterior doors you're you're asking for trouble i'm not saying to don't do it they, the less expensive options are more suited for interior doors um, doors that aren't like an emergency type thing. Um, Open Sesame is not the only game in town, but anyone in our world, if you ask them what door opener to install, that's what they're going to tell you. I mean, uh, it, the other company, they do have certain door openers that once you install it, you cannot use that door like normal. You have to use the door opener, period. You can never open that door with your hand nor anyone else. Um, they open Sesame and some of the others. They're not the only people that do this, but there's more people that lock the door out of normal use because they're trying to keep the price down. On open Sesame, the door is not actually used until you push the button. There's an actual locking magnet that, that engages the door opener to the the arm. And if you don't hit the the open button, then those magnets are separate, and it opens up like a normal door. Most people aren't even going to even know that that is there. You're definitely not going to have the tension of that motor that, that you do on commercial doors. You're not going to have that tension of you turning the motor if you're not actually using it. Great. Thank you for sharing um, and for answering questions. I'm just looking to see if there were any others that come in. Um, yes, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts there, Vicki, about um, feeling like there's hope. Um, that's what we want. We want you to feel like oh, yes. there's hope and you don't need to be scared of being alone. Um, I mean, I think a side so. benefit of the the smart home stuff is like the calling and the um, the video chat aspect of it you know again we work with a lot of people with als and they may not be able to speak to be understood on a phone call but if their caregiver can see them you know they can acknowledge yes or no with their facial expressions and so you know you just if i was the caregiver you know, i just get the funny feeling i just want to see his face i just want to make sure he's there and everything's okay you know so very quickly i could pull up a video hey Everything going good? Yes. Okay. I'll be I'll be home in thirty minutes. And just you know, keeping that connection going, and not having the person on the other end have to do anything. That's a huge uh, thing that a lot of our clients really like. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. I don't think I see any more questions. Um, so thank you, Antoinette and Matthew, for being here. Um, we greatly appreciate uh, your time and for you sharing your expertise with our community. Um, it's been very informative. So thank you both.